Vitamin D breakthrough, finally. Are you on oral vitamin D? You might think again. So, Brian, the rumor has it that we are all pretty much vitamin D deficient. Is this true? It's not true for everybody, but it's true for a lot of people. Everyone's indoors. They're hiding from the sun, shielding from the sun, putting suntan screens on. But yeah, a lot of people are deficient, especially people who live in the northern regions, northern latitudes, the northern hemisphere. These people are very vulnerable for vitamin D deficiency during the wintertime. So what can these deficiencies cause if left unattended for too long? They can lead to everything from arthritis, cancer, diabetes, various types of autoimmune disease, uh, inflammatory bowel diseases, uh, can really go on almost infinitum. In fact, vitamin D deficiency increases all-cause mortality, basically meaning death from all causes, Bob. Well, that sounds nasty. But if, if people are worried about having low vitamin D levels, are there any tests available? There are tests to test or evaluate your vitamin D levels, checking your 25-hydroxy vitamin D levels. And yes, you can absolutely ascertain what the correct amount of vitamin D you should have in your blood would be. I should say, though, that many of the tests are a bit conservative, and they consider that 30 nanograms per milliliter is acceptable. My opinion is it should be a little bit higher than that for optimal health. And if you have a test like this and you, you live in Europe or somewhere else where you get your, your answer in a different kind of measurement, uh, there are online converters available? Absolutely, Bob. That's a great point. Yeah, there are online conversions available. In fact, it doesn't even matter which country you are. Uh, a lot of people just arbitrarily decide to use one conversion versus the other. So there's many conversions available. If you go to vitamindcouncil.org, they have this conversion available there. In many cases, supplements are administrated as formulas consisting of several active ingredients. This is mainly to boost potency and overall efficiency. Are there any so-called cofactors to consider while being on vitamin D3 supplements? There are. Actually, there are cofactors that improve your ability to convert vitamin D into its active form. Uh, for example, when you absorb the sun rays through your skin, and it actually starts to convert into one form of the vitamin D. Your kidneys ultimately have to convert it into its active form. And there are certain nutrients that really determine this conversion. So it could be things like vitamin A, it could be zinc, it could be boron. So those are some of examples of some things that are necessary for conversion. Also the mineral magnesium. And I'm betting you know, vitamin K2. Absolutely, Bob, that's a good point. Vitamin K2 can, especially in cases with oral vitamin D, prevent excess calcification because if you take a vitamin D supplement, what happens is that vitamin D itself, when it's in the bloodstream, increases the intestinal absorption of calcium. The problem, though, is, is that the body has an inability to completely regulate this process. Therefore, you could have an excessive amount of calcification and with vitamin K2 can actually help, you could say, control these levels so that the calcification is not excessive. Because what vitamin K2 does essentially is that it balances this out. So if you take oral vitamin D3, you should be cognizant of the fact that you'll need some vitamin K2 also. So when listening to you, Brian, it's very obvious that we really need to monitor our levels of vitamin D3 and if necessary, regulate them. But for most people, natural sunlight, you know, it isn't really possible the year round. So is taking oral vitamin D3 just as good as getting the real deal? And I would also like to ask you, are there any risks with oral vitamin D3? Two things to think about here. One is, yes, obviously during, you know, especially if you live in the northern latitudes, especially during the winter, getting vitamin D is impossible. So then you have to figure, well, if you can't get it from your sunlight, Maybe you can get it from a tanning bed, for example, or you can get it uh, through a vitamin D spray. This is, might be an alternative way to get your vitamin D. But if you're taking vitamin D3 orally, yes, there are risks. And uh, the risks involve the fact that if you don't monitor your levels, you might be taking too much. I did sort of hint early in the earlier question that you might have an inability to regulate your calcium levels. 
you know, calcium is, is not always a good thing. It can sometimes land in soft tissue or in your arteries. And you certainly don't want a calcification in, in areas where, you know, other than the teeth or the bones. So having vitamin K2, as I mentioned earlier, is a cofactor to prevent this. So there might be some more optimal ways to get vitamin D to prevent, you know, some problems. You mentioned taking it as a spray, and, and, and my question to you then is, could you get vitamin D3 through your skin with a spray, or is this so-called transdermal distribution working? Yes, actually it does work. There's a couple of things to, to, to think about. Number one is, if you imagine patches, you know, transdermal patches is well known, transdermal means through the skin, and uh, in fact, anything you can eat, you can literally put it on your skin, your skin will absorb it. But a vitamin D spray or topical spray does contain something called DMSO or dimethyl sulfoxide, which is known to carry things into the blood from the skin. So this is an adjuvant or, an, or you, know, you know, something that helps improve that actual mobility of the vitamin D to get it into the bloodstream. Now, once it hits your bloodstream, it goes through various conversion processes, but we'll get into that a little bit later. But yes, it's absolutely absorbable through the skin. So, Brian, can you please tell us a bit more about this new way to obtain vitamin D3? Yes, Bob. There's a topical delivery of vitamin D, and it's safe. And researchers did confirm this and found that there are significantly lower risks in response to topical spray as opposed to the oral form. And uh, what's more interesting is that it's going to have a longer half-life, so it's going to stay in your body longer. Also, it avoids those risks I was explaining earlier about the calcification calcification of the kidneys, increase of urinary calcium excretion. You know, basically anything revolving calcium is a bit of a risk factor with oral vitamin D. So this topical spray will negate this and really act more like natural sun-like exposure, which is what we really want. And once it hits your bloodstream, not only is this more a slower process than oral vitamin D, it allows longer lasting elevation of your vitamin D levels. This is similar to actual natural sunlight exposure. So as it promotes vitamin D receptor interactions, this is really akin to the way it's supposed to be. And um, it allows the natural conversion process to be similar to natural sunlight conversion. So this is really the way nature intended it to be. Well, this is really interesting information, and I'm thinking it's you know it's so much easier to get this if you are an old man or woman, you have problems taking pills. This is really an effective way to boost your levels of vitamin D3. But are, are there any negative sides to this? How about the price level, for example? How much does this cost on a monthly basis? Well, your vitamin D requirements might determine what that average cost would be. Uh, but if you throw out a conservative figure, you might be looking at less than $7 a month. And, and how go, much would that give you, you know? Uh, if people are, are um, used to taking this as a pill, they know that they get 2,000 or 5,000 or 10,000 international units a day. How about the spray? How does it work? Well, uh, generally what happens is a, a bottle of vitamin D spray roughly supplies about 430 applications or sprays, each containing 4,000 international units. For most people, 4,000 international units per day is all that is necessary. What's really wonderful, though, about the spray is that if you don't have the best digestion, oral vitamin D is simply not going to be absorbed very well. Uh, this is different with vitamin D spray because it's going to get through the skin much more effectively. You're going to absorb more of it. So 4,000 international units is probably going to be sufficient. However, if you have darker skin, you might consider doubling that amount, maybe something closer to 10,000 international units. So a bottle's gonna last you about 430, 4,000 international unit doses, if you will. So the, the cost might vary, you know, depending on the individual. Yeah, okay, and, and you shouldn't like take a shower after you apply this, you should let it sink in, yes? Yes, Bob, that's a great point. You see, in fact, one point I should say is, if you're getting natural sun exposure, you know, during the summer when there's actually vitamin D producing rays. And if you take a shower or bathe right after that, the natural oils on your skin that absorb the vitamin D, the pre-vitamin D conversion anyway, that's going to be washed off. Now, likewise, if you're applying vitamin D spray, you know what, it's best to apply it after a bath. Therefore, there's no risk of losing uh, the effect of the absorption. And that's the issue in a nutshell.